Good morning and welcome to St. John's Episcopal Church in Gig Harbor, Washington. We're glad you could join us for Trinity Sunday. And before we start, I would like to thank our choral scholar, scholars. They're a part of our ministry here at St. John's that enrich our choir, our music, and our community life. This year we had Chase Alm, Luke Hartley, Gillian Dockett, and Lydia Bill. Thank you, all of you. And while we're talking about music, if you would like to be part of a virtual choir that's singing for the July 4th service, uh, please contact the church or look in your church email and we'll get the information you need to do that. It could be you or a friend or anyone who would like to sing. So let us worship together. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and blessed, blessed be God's kingdom, kingdom now, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us your servant's grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship 
and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory. O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome, and it separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. And there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. 
So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. On Sundays like this one, I often like to start my sermon with humor, but you know what? There really aren't a lot of jokes about the Trinity, and the ones that, there, that I found weren't that funny. Maybe that's because the topic of the Trinity is serious. Likely, though, it's because we just don't get it. And who could blame anyone for being a bit confused about the Trinity? I know that for most of my life, it was more than a bit of a mystery. In fact, 
For much of my spiritual life, I thought of God as being in heaven, Jesus as the one being on earth, and the spirit as some kind of otherworldly power. It wasn't uncommon for me to think of them as separate realities. Now, when quizzed, I would appropriately acknowledge each one of them as God. Also, when asked, I would affirm that there's only one God. But what I was doing was kind of a double think that didn't reconcile all my differing and conflicting opinions. No, for many years, the Trinity was a mystery, something I affirmed, but in no way understood. Then in my late seminary career, I was exposed to an idea that has forever changed my understanding of God, and by extension, my understanding of what it means to be a human being. The radical idea that, has, that changed everything is how we understand the basic nature of God. Is God an individual? Does God exist as we do individually and apart? Or is there something else going on in the nature of God? You see, if God exists as an individual, then we're forced to take one of two stances. Either we affirm that God is one and we are left with Jesus and the Spirit as something less than or other than God. Or we affirm Jesus and the Spirit as God and we are left with three gods. Now, if that's, now that's if we accept the idea of God as an individual. But what if we instead understood the nature of God as being communal? What if the idea of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is about a community of persons who exist as a single reality? This would allow us to affirm that there's only one God, while at the same time affirming Jesus as God and the Spirit as God. If that seems a bit confusing, there's a simpler but imperfect way of getting at what I'm saying. The current population of the United States is 328 million people. Now, we would never claim that there are 328 individual United States. No, each of us is an American. Each of us is a citizen of the United States. The question is whether we will focus exclusively on our individual identity or our communal one. There is only one United States, but each of us as Americans are an expression of our nation. We are many, and yet we are one. Now, as I said, this is not a perfect analogy, but it gets us to the idea of God existing as community. Each of the persons of the Trinity fully expresses the truth of God, but God cannot be understood apart from all three persons. God is not an individual, but a community. And the nature of God is to be in relationship with one another and ultimately with all of creation. Even in this creation story that we heard this morning, we can find the Trinity at work. God exists as creator, the creative word spoken, and the spirit that hovers over the face of the deep. St. Augustine expressed this idea in a different way when he said that if we want to understand the Trinity, then we need only think about a relationship of love. That in a relationship of love, there's one who is the lover, there's one who is the beloved, and there is the love that ex is exchanged between them. That leaves us with, so what? What difference does all of this head knowledge make in our lives? How is this more than just a little bit of brain candy? Well, the implications are huge if we stop to think about it. First off, as we heard in the creation story this morning, we are made in the image of God. And that means that we are called to be more than individuals. We are made to be part of a community. In fact, we can't be fully human if we're not actively involved in community with our fellow human beings. But we are called to be community in the same way that God is community within God's self and with us. We're called to be a people of steadfast love and faithfulness. We're called to love in a way that transforms the world into a place of justice, mercy, and genuine care for all. This means that all of the stuff that Jesus taught us about how we are to treat one another wasn't just him giving us a way of being good. It isn't just a set of expectations that God is placing on us. It's a call to live fully into the image of God. 
We are being called to be agents of peace, justice, and reconciliation in the world today. We are being called to meet the needs of the poor and the dispossessed. We are being called to welcome the stranger and to bring in the estranged. We are being called to be a voice for the oppressed and a people who speak truth to power in the face of injustice. This is more important than ever in light of recent events. For centuries, our nation has been fractured by the sin of racism. People of color have been disadvantaged at the hands of white, uh, people of color have been disadvantaged at the hands of a white majority. They have suffered economically, socially, and in terms of their health. And as we have been reminded over the last couple of years, they have been the target of prejudice and violence. The death of George Floyd at the hand of a Minneapolis police officer is just the most recent in a string of unjust deaths. This latest injustice has caused years of pent-up frustration and anger to spill over into protest. People of all colors are massing in the streets of cities all across America to express their discontent with the status quo. They're expressing their desire for a different kind of community, one in which everyone, regardless of skin color, will be treated with equity and justice. Their vision is congruent with the one we have just discussed of what it is like to live in the community expressed by God. Most of those participating in the protests have been peaceful, but some have resorted to violence. It's not clear whether all of that violence is related directly to the protests or whether or not it's being caused by those who wish to escalate the fraying of our community. Even so, in the midst of the violence, there are myriad examples of a different vision of community emerging. Within the places blighted by disorder and destruction, food and money has been donated to those whose businesses have been destroyed. People have organized medical care and provide sanctuary for injured protesters. In some communities, police officers have shown solidarity with protesters by taking a knee or even joining in the march. But even with such positive signs, the truth is that we are a nation that has become ever increasingly polarized. This is true in terms of racist attitudes, but also in terms of the current pandemic, politics, economics, and even the news we get. In many ways, we have lost our sense of community, our sense of humanity, and are quick to, at best, isolate ourselves from one another, and at worst, to demonize one another. But as those who worship God as Trinity, God as a community of persons, we are called to be different, to both embody and proclaim a different way of being with one another, in the face of racism and the general polarization of our communities, we are called to join in with those who are protesting and find our own ways of expressing truth to power. We are being called to break down the systems and patterns of behavior that perpetuate racism and the other ways in which we violate the sacred nature of the human family. We are being called to find a common voice even in the midst of injustice and disagreement. We are being called to love everyone in the same way, and that means that we are also being called to turn the hearts of those who do not love as God loves. We are called to transform both our local and our national community into something different than what it is. And just because most of us are stuck sheltering in place during this time of pandemic doesn't mean we can't do that. We can use the technology at our disposal to do much of that work. We can call one another to keep our relationships alive. We can reach out to the homebound. We can, if we are not at high risk, volunteer to help meet the needs of those impoverished or to participate in acts that give voice to the victims of injustice. We can write and call our public leaders and hold them accountable to both the injustice of our system and the needs of all the members of our community. And these behaviors don't have to be huge heroic acts. They can be small and simple as long as they're authentic. Such small actions 
believe it or not, have huge ripples in the community. By doing these things, we live into the image of God. We live into the Trinity. We come to experience God as community, and we have the opportunity to come face to face with God as our Father, God as our brother, God as the love that exists between us. On this Trinity Sunday, let us take comfort in the God who lives with us in the midst of our relationships. Let us be encouraged to be actively let us be encouraged to actively be the spirit of community in our world. And let us always be the embodiment of God, whom we love, who loves us, and who is love itself. Let us stand and share our hope in God's redeeming through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, Father the Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. 
Last summer, St. John's Parish identified a new parish mission. It's just three words, be like Jesus. And there's a brief catechism we sometimes share to remind us of this, to keep it before our minds. And so we'd like to share that during the summer in our worship. So if you're not from St. John's and you're watching us now, you are welcome to join us in this call. St. John's, what do you want? We want want to be be like Jesus. Jesus. St. John's, what does that mean? We We want want to love and serve God and and our neighbors neighbors as ourselves. ourselves. St. John's, what will that require? We We must no longer live for ourselves alone, but join God's renewal of creation, that all might flourish. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for Michael, our presiding bishop, for Greg, our bishop, for Cricket, our missionary, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for this nation for integrity in our public servants, for truth and clarity in the presidential campaign, and a spirit of justice for and among all people. Pray for the United States. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for our neighbors especially those served through our ministries and mission partners, St. John's English Language Community, Fish Food Bank, Food Backpacks for Kids, the Harbor Hope Center, our sisters in the prison, Alcoholics Anonymous, the Key Peninsula Free Clinic. Pray for our neighbors. I ask your prayers for all who are affected by the coronavirus pandemic and for those making decisions that affect us all. Pray for relief. I ask your prayers for members of St. John's living with chronic illness, Joan Hansen, Jerry Violet, Kathleen Richter, Neil Paquin, John Hayes, J.T. Bottom, Jenny Bittner, Wayne Kremen, Jed Demers. 
for parishioners who have asked for our prayers, Ken and Ginger Barons, Julie Bottom, Bev Moore. For our family members and friends, Andrea Stearns, Dottie, Alexander, Janie and Charles, David Blake, Cindy Rosa, Dan, Rosemary, Elizabeth Ritchie. For those who have contracted the coronavirus, Annabella Brock. For whom else shall we pray? I ask your prayers for the departed. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our day. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all mercy, we confess, we confess that, that we have, have sinned, sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Before we proceed with the peace, it's my great pleasure to share that we've revived our prayer shawl ministry under the leadership of Linda Rines. Those who knit these shawls pray as they knit, as a physical gesture of love and petition to God. And as people have need of them for seasons of their life, we're able to give them these shawls, these warm, fuzzy, wearable prayers that communicate both God's love and the love of this church. And as you've heard in our prayers in the last two weeks, Annabella Brock, a former member of our parish who moved away, has contracted the coronavirus. And we're sharing with her this prayer shawl, uh, which is the love of God and the love of this church. So God bless this shawl. May its warmth be a sacrament of your warmth. Its love a sacrament of your love. And may Annabella know through its wearing that she is not alone, but she is one with this church, the whole church, the whole world, and with you. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. May the peace of the Lord be with those in your heart. May the peace of the Lord be with all in the world. May the peace of the Lord be with all of the world. 
peace. Peace. As always, we invite your generosity with the church, with our mission partners, with any agency that is helping to bring about God's peace in this world. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets and their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will, we were created and have their being. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord, for we are sinners in your sight. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood he reconciled us. By his wounds we are healed. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. Oh.
So, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine, gave thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we, we celebrate, celebrate his, his death, death and resurrection, resurrection as, as we, we await the day, the day of his, his coming. coming. Lord, God of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this holy communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen, Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Let us pray together. Loving Jesus, thank you for all the benefits you have given me, for all the pains and insults you have borne for me. Since I cannot now receive your body and blood physically, I ask you to come spiritually into my heart. O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I know your grace, feel your love, and walk in your ways now and always. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And may the God who is one and made you in that image grow you in love and unity in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, that. Good enough. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks.